Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, begin this presentation by these uh, two quotes uh, by reindeer herders that we have interviewed in Finland. Uh, and uh, in these quotes, uh, the reindeer herders, they talk about the personality and uh, individual relationships they have with the reindeer, uh, particularly those that they train, train for working. And why I chose these quotes uh, uh, at the beginning of this presentation uh, is because this presentation will also be about the individuality, personality, uh, and in general difference among the reindeer. So the reindeer herd uh, is not a homogeneous unit, uh, but a social group, and it consists of individuals with different ages, sexes, and other social roles, and also personalities. So all the reindeer, they are persons and sentient beings to their herders, but they can be so in very different ways. And this is not uh, very commonly acknowledged in archaeology, at least so far. So in this presentation, I will try uh, in a very short time uh, to weave together some archaeological data and also traditional knowledge of reindeer herders to show how different kinds of reindeer may have been alive together with humans in the past. And this work is very much a combination of work from uh, people who have been working in my project for, for the past five years. So it's uh, very much a team effort, but the rest of the team uh, couldn't be here today. <clears throat> uh, just to begin with a really, really short and concise history of reindeer herding to give you some context. Uh, so reindeer herding is and has been practiced widely in northern Eurasia, from Fenoscandia in the west to eastern Siberia. Uh, and it seems that reindeer herding may have begun in some, some parts of Siberia around the turn of the millennium. Uh, but generally speaking, the timing of the uh, reindeer domestication and the connections between the different reindeer herding traditions are not very well understood uh, at present. But today we will focus on reindeer herding among the Sami of northern Fennoscandia. So let's see if this works and whether I can find Fennoscandia. No, here. <clears throat> so here is uh, a very general chronology of the development of Sami reindeer herding, along with uh, changes and continuities in various reindeer herding practices are related to reindeer herding. And as you may, may see from this picture, uh, reindeer herding among the Sami began around the 7th and 8th centuries with small scale herding mixed with uh, hunting, gathering and fishing. And then mobile pastoralism uh, developed around the 15th century, and there were all kinds of environmental and societal changes happening at that time, uh, which probably triggered uh, the onset of mobile pastoralism in many parts of the Sami land, but not, not everywhere. But even though there was this uh, transition to mobile pastoralism, uh, there was a lot of cultural continuity in reindeer herding traditions across this transition. Uh, for instance, in, in many reindeer herding practices, such as feeding and and raw reindeer use, and also in religious and uh, ritual practices. Uh, in the traditional uh, Sami worldview, the world is understood as a rela relational unity, and it includes both human and non-human, animate and inanimate, inanimate actors. And in the Sami worldview, uh, all the places and landscape and living beings and things, they always uh, obtain their meaning in interaction with each other and in relation to each other uh, and in relation to people when people are encountering them in the world and in their daily tasks. And these non-human and human worlds and supernatural worlds, they exist uh, at the same time simultaneously and, for instance, sacred sites in the landscapes are uh, sort of contact points uh, of these worlds. As to non-human animals, uh, the pastoral Sami, they understand animals as persons, uh, and they understand that animals are capable of communication, emotions, uh, intentional action, and also meaningful relationships with people. But animal personhood is considered different from human personhood, and um, animals are persons and individuals in, in different ways, in different situations, when they come to contact with people. So what kind of uh, reindeer individuals were there then? Uh, reindeer herders' traditional knowledge can uh, go some way in explaining this uh, and uh, sort of illustrating this, uh, this matter. 
Uh, and I will talk a little bit about the reindeer herd structure and also reindeer like conceptions of reindeer individuality and personhood that uh, <clears throat> came up with the interviews we have conducted uh, with present day reindeer herders. So uh, the reindeer herd, herd structure has uh, changed uh, quite a lot in uh, last decades when reindeer ma management practices have changed. So nowadays meat production is the primary goal uh, of reindeer herding. Uh, but in the past, uh, reindeer herd and the reindeer were much more multi-purpose. So there were individuals for several purposes, meat production, reproduction, working, traveling, herd cohesion and so on. And uh, the herders, they always aim for a herd that is diverse in terms of animals of different ages, sizes, types, social roles and so forth. Uh, because this kind of diverse herd is uh, strong to adapt. Uh, in, in changing conditions, uh, and it's called a beautiful herd by the reindeer herders. And beyond these social roles, uh, the interviews my research team conducted with reindeer herders, they also highlighted that all reindeer are different, uh, different individuals for the herders. So the herders, they consistently tell that all reindeer have different personalities, uh, especially in the context of working reindeer training uh, the personalities and like individual learning styles of the animals, they need to be taken into account. <clears throat> and, and the herders are very aware of these issues. Uh, and that's because the herders, they interact with the working reindeer over the course of several seasons or even with the course of several years, so they get to know them really well. So they are like friends to them. And this is also reflected in the way they talk about these animals. They highlight their personalities and, and like the personal growth of this particular reindeer. And they tell stories about these animals and they always have names and they tell stories about the reindeer years after they have died. So they are really like friends and companions and individuals to the, to the herders. And um, many herders also say that uh, a fully trained draw reindeer uh, is very different from like ordinary herd reindeer. So they are described as tame and they are known by name and they are known by their personality and individual traits. Whereas like the ordinary herd reindeer are not necessarily uh, as much individuals uh, as, the, as the working reindeer might be. <clears throat> Uh, now I will talk also really briefly uh, about archaeology, uh, so uh, how we might go about looking at these things in the archaeological record. So how do we look at individual animals and, and their social roles in the osteological record? And the example I'm going to show you very briefly is from two Sami dwelling sites in Finland, and they date from the 14th century to the 17th century, so they are called Nukkumajoki and Juikenttä. Uh, and the faunal remains at these sites, they were mostly reindeer. And there was also uh, material remains that included reindeer harness pieces, which uh, suggests that uh, the use of draught animals was that people at this place were uh, using reindeer as draught animals. In the, in the zoological assemblages, there were animals from all age categories, but adult individuals uh, dominated. And this is consistent with the butchering strategy of the traditional reindeer herding. Uh, tradition, and there were also wild animal bones, for instance, fur animals, wild birds and fish in these assemblages. So it means that the people who lived in these places, uh, they practiced a mixed livelihood of hunting, fishing, gathering, and also small scale reindeer herding. And I'm a zoo archaeologist, so this is what I'm mostly interested in, but I'm not going to talk about the technical details in, in, in these conference presentations uh, at all, but you can ask questions uh, later if you're inter interested in the technicalities. But I just want to show that zoo archaeological analyses can be used to find different reindeer, for instance, in terms of age, gender and other social roles in the archaeological record. And here I will especially focus on identification of working reindeer, because we have been uh, talking about quite a lot of the individuality and personhood of working reindeer in the context of their training. So I will particularly show some results we have uh, had using a combination of traditional paleopathological analysis and also analysis of muscle activity markers in the phalanges. And overall, our analysis of these variables show that they were definitely working reindeer in the assemblages. Uh, and working reindeer, they are mostly li most likely castrated males. 
but there were also like these ordinary herd reindeer uh, of different ages and sexes in the assemblages. So the paleopathology shows that there were working reindeer in both of these assemblages, uh, but as a method, it's not suitable for, for saying how much, <laughs> how many, how many working reindeer there were, there were in the herds. So the herd structure cannot be accessed through paleopathological analysis, but it does show uh, that uh, working reindeer were, were present from the 14th century onwards. Uh, muscle activity marker analysis, uh, on the other hand, uh, to some extent can also say something about the herd structure, and this is really exciting uh, for me. So muscle activity marker analysis of phalanges combined with osteometrics, uh, it's uh, also useful for identification of working reindeer, and it also works in identification of uh, wild forest reindeer and domesticated reindeer. So the, you can see like the ordinary herd reindeer and the wild forest reindeer and the working reindeer uh, based on these analyses. And these results are not published yet, uh, but they will be soon, <laughs> I hope. And uh, this is just to show an example of the potential uh, herd structures uh, on these two sides. And as you may be able to see, <laughs> if the picture is not too small, there are quite a lot of undetermined individuals in each assembly. So, so the blue, blue bar is that herded reindeer, so the ordinary herd reindeer are the orange bars. Uh, working is the grey and uh, yellow is wild and uh, the light blue is wild or working, uh, cannot be identified based on this analysis. So all in all, uh, two archaeological data can go a long way in showing uh, these different social roles and different types of reindeer uh, that were present and engaging uh, with people who lived at these sites. And to sum up, yes. <laughs> I can do it in five minutes, no problem. <laughs> so uh, as the zoo archaeological data and the interview data shows, uh, all the reindeer were not the same. Uh, they were wild and domesticated reindeer, and they were domesticated reindeer with different char characteristics, uh, ages, sexes, social roles, uh, personalities, and so forth. And zoo archaeological data can be analyzed in many ways to see some of these characteristics and social roles. Uh, in the assemblages. And as it's clear from the interview data, uh, reindeer are persons and individuals, but each in their own way for the reindeer herders. And this individuality and personhood is very situational and it always emerges in interactions and encounters with the reindeer. And while we don't know how these, how well, the traditional knowledge of the today's reindeer herders reflects the experiences of the ancient reindeer herders. Uh, there's probably a lot to learn from their insights anyway. So uh, I think we can reflect on the traditional knowledge of reindeer herders to gain a more holistic understanding of the meaning of the archaeological evidence and sort of the range of human animal relationships and how they were played out and reinforced in, in certain reindeer herding practices. Uh, for instance, the ideas of reindeer personhood and learning abilities, they were likely embedded in the past ancient working reindeer training as well. Uh, although like the technicalities and the, for instance, preferred personality traits of the reindeer may have been different in the past, but the idea of learning capacities and individuality of the reindeer and building trust with the reindeer and so forth were probably best present in ancient, ancient times as well, uh, like they are today. And it's likely that people interacted differently with different kinds of reindeer. And uh, those interactions were reflected in the ways these animals were alive to the herders in their own ways. And as the last word uh, of the herd composition, uh, I, I think it's also likely that the herd composition we can see in the archaeological uh, data reflects a holistic care of a multi-purpose reindeer herd with different kinds of individuals and adaptive capacities. So I think uh, our archaeological data is also uh, able to uh, illustrate how a beautiful herd was in the past. Thank you. <laughs>